I open my eyes. I open my eyes. Good morning. My name's Jane Goldman. I, I work at the University of Glasgow. And I'm very honored to be uh, introducing Unlacing Orlando. So I hope you're all raring to unlace Orlando. Some of you may have already seen the performance last night or you're about to go and see it tonight or in the next few days. I envy you that first viewing because it is absolutely stunning, Cryptic's production of, of Orlando. So first of all, I'd like to, to thank Cryptic for putting on um, this production of Orlando, which is utterly stunning. And um, it, it's interesting, isn't it, that at the same time in New York, there's a production of Orlando going on. So clearly, Orlando is speaking to our present culture in important ways. If on both sides of the Atlantic, there are uh, stunning productions of, of this work going on. Imagine, if you can, that you're in an, in an intimate relationship with a well-known writer, uh, an unconventional relationship, even an adulterous relationship on both sides, and you receive a letter like this. Yesterday morning I was in despair. I couldn't screw a word from me, and at last dropped my head in my hands and dipped my pen in the ink and wrote these words as if automatically on a clean sheet, Orlando, a biography. No sooner had I done this than my body was flooded with rapture and my brain with ideas. I wrote rapidly till 12. So every morning I am going to write fiction, my own fiction, till 12. But listen, suppose Orlando turns out to be Vita, and it's all about you and the lusts of your flesh and the lure of your mind, heart you have none, who go gallivanting down the lanes with Mary Campbell. Suppose there's the kind of shimmer of reality which sometimes attaches to my people as the luster on an oyster shell. Suppose I say that Sybil Colfax next October says, there's Virginia gone and written a book about Vita, an Aussie, Dickinson, chores with his great chaps, and Bayard of Heinemann, guffaws, shall you mind? Say yes or no. Your excellence as a subject arises largely from your noble birth. But what's 400 years of nobility all the same? And the opportunity thus given for florid descriptive passages in great abundance. Also, I admit, I should like to untwine and twist again some very odd, incongruous strands in you, going at length into the question of Campbell, and also, as I told you, it sprung upon me how I could revolutionize biography in a night and so, if agreeable to you, I would like to toss this up in the air and see what happens. Well, that's what Virginia Woolf wrote to Vita Sackville West in October 1927. So, how would you feel? Not too happy, I would have thought. And was Vita aware of Virginia's reputation within her family and among her close friends? A reputation for unreliability in the sense of passing on and encouraging gossip and being indiscreet. Then there is the question of her judgment. When she was writing Roger Fryer biography, she recorded a conversation with the Keyneses in January 1940 about Roger. Can I mention erection, I asked. <laughs> Lydia, what? Maynard, stiff, their private word. No, you can't. I should mind your saying it. Such revelations have to be in key with their time. The time not come yet. Then Virginia mused, sodomy and the WC disinfected. Is he right or only public school? And there's a passage early on in the biography of Fry, which may give the reader pause even today. Uh, you may read it for yourself. One of Wolfe's correspondents wrote, was it necessary to give it? It was quite the most unpleasant thing I have read in my life. Yet Vita replied to Virginia on the 11th of October, 1927. My God, Virginia, if ever I was thrilled and terrified, it is at the prospect of being projected into the shape of Orlando. What fun for you. What fun for me. You see, any vengeance that you ever want to take will lie ready to your hand. Yes, go ahead. Toss up your pancake, brown it nicely on both sides, pour brandy over it, and serve hot. 
you have my full permission. Only I think ha that having drawn and quartered me, unwound and retwisted me, or whatever it is that you intend to do, you ought to dedicate it to your victim. For the known genesis of Orlando, however, we need to go back to January 1927, when Virginia was taken by Vita to stay with her father at Knoll for two nights. Virginia recorded in her diary, Vita took me over the four acres of building, which she loves, too little conscious beauty for my tastes, smallish rooms looking onto buildings, no views, yet one or two things remain, Vita stalking in her Turkish dress, attended by small boys down the gallery, wafting them on like some tall sailing ship, the sort of covey of noble English life, dogs walloping, children crowding, all very free and stately, and a cart bringing wood in to be sawn. How do you see that, I asked Vita. She said she saw it as something that had gone on for hundreds of years. They had brought wood in from the park to replenish the great fires like this for centuries, and her ancestresses had walked so on the snow with their great dogs bounding by them. All the centuries seemed lit up, the past expressive, articulate, not dumb and forgotten, but a crowd of people stood behind, not dead at all, not remarkable, fair-faced, long-limbed, affable. And so we reached the days of Elizabeth quite easily. After tea, looking for letters of Dryden's to show me, she tumbled out a love letter of Lord Dorset's, 17th century, with a lock of his soft gold-tinted hair which I held in my hand a moment. One had a sense of links fished up into the light which are usually submerged. Otherwise, no particular awe or any great sense of difference or distinction. They're not a brilliant race. The space and comeliness of it all struck me. Virginia was correcting the proofs of To the Lighthouse in March, and it was published on the anniversary of her mother's death, the 5th of May. Meanwhile, in March, she told Vita, who was in Persia, that she'd thought of an entirely new book. But this wasn't the Orlando as we know it. She recorded in her diary, suddenly between 12 and 1 last night, I conceived a whole fantasy to be called the Jessamy Brides. Why, I wonder? I have rayed round it several scenes, two women, poor, solitary, at the top of a house. One can see anything, for this is all fantasy. The Tower Bridge, clouds, aeroplanes, also old men listening in the room over the way. Everything is to be tumbled in pell-mell. It is to be written as I write letters at the top of my speed, on the ladies of Langochlan, on Mrs. Fladgate, on people passing. No attempt is to be made to realize the character. Sapphism is to be suggested. Satire is to be the main note. Satire and wildness. The ladies are to have Constantinople in view, dreams of golden domes. My own lyric vein is to be satirized, everything mocked, and it is to end with three dots. So, for the truth is, I feel the need of an escapade after these serious, poetic, experimental books whose form is always so closely considered. I want to kick up my heels and be off. I want to embody all those innumerable little ideas and tiny stories which flash into my mind at all seasons. I think this will be great fun to write, and it will rest my head before starting the very serious, mystical, poetical work which I want to come next. And she added in the margin in 1933, Orlando leading to the waves. Um, hello, everybody, and um, um, let me first contextualize what will be the backdrop here. Um, I assume many of you have seen Sally Potter's film, Orlando, um, and um, this is a, a sort of towards, well, really the beginning of the film. Um, this is a, a fabulous Quentin Crisp as, a, a, as Elizabeth I. Um, I'm really grateful for Stuart's um, um, talk because mine will complement in, in, in some um, strange ways what he's saying um, and I will pick up on, on some questions that he raised uh, like the question of facts and uh, facts being manipulated, illuminated and yet not losing their integrity uh, which is what um, 
Wolf said was um, a skill of a new biographer. Uh, in this dialogic exchange today, I would like to present to your attention two aspects of any work of art, uh, but Orlando in particular, um, and I would like you to consider these in conjunction. Um, the first aspect um, of the work of art, and of Orlando in particular, that I'm interested in, or the first proposition, if you wish, is the nature and status of works of art, such as Virginia Woolf's Orlando, or Cryptic's performance of Orlando, or Sally Potter's film Orlando, as archives. Archives of first historical facts, or real facts, um, what a chap named Paul Ricoeur called prefigured matter of history, something that both enables and shapes figuration of work of art. Second, as archives of the actual material used, and I, I really mean physical material, texture, um, material that of course has its own history, materials such as words, visual images, sounds, stroboscopic light contouring the character on the stage with, that we see so yesterday, particles of clothes and costumes, and so on and so on. So, so material, the archive of these material bits. And thirdly, the archive of desires, of aspirations, of fears, of nightmares, social and individual. But I told you I'm interested in two aspects, and, and the second one is really integral um, uh, to the first one. Um, uh, as Jane announced, I'm particularly interested in uh, the afterlives of a work of art, um, um, or its continued life in various forms, and how these forms interrelate with each other and with the work of art. Um, and this is, again, complementary to uh, and interacting with Stuart's exploration of the text's pre-life, so text's afterlife. Um, and this consideration will lead me to br <coughs> rather briefly address um, Daryl Pinkney's textual reworking of Wolf's Orlando, which served as the basis for Cryptic's performance, and onto this particular archive that records Sally Potter's personal and professional work um, with Wolf's Orlando, and that I and my colleagues at Essex are privileged to be developing with Sally Potter. So I shall start by asking you provisionally to adopt the idea of work of art as archive and adaptation as re-archiving. In other words, the idea that archives are creative and not these very boring um, ag agglomerations of, of you know, papers and artifacts. And I would like to invite you to contemplate the properties of such an archive with me. The first one I can think of is the following. Archives are ghostly. Their very existence depends on the activity of ghosting, and that in a few distinct ways. To begin with, archives, like Virginia Woolf's Orlando, operate as haunting visits to the spaces of the past human activity. And insofar as that activity is finished, and regardless of whether the participant or participants in that activity are dead or alive, the archive figures as a ghostly metonymy for the activity in question. It repeats the activity, or a fractal thereof, but it does not perform the actual action. There is much to indicate that works of art in general, and some works of art in particular, come into being and operate as archives. This pertains especially to the works that shape or define themselves, ludically or in earnest, as biographies. Fond of ghosting and haunting, as you know, Virginia Woolf was also fond of archiving. She was one of those modernist collectors, although a rather different kind from, say, Walter Benjamin. Both these passions are nicely embodied in Orlando, where the time travels of the sex-changing protagonists take form of archiving culture, spaces, times. As a ludic archive in the guise of an impossible Bildungsroman, Wolf's Orlando examines how we relate to the documentation of the material world in a fashion that is both illuminating and problematic, as Wolf scholars know very well. Whatever evidence we have about the process of making up Orlando, and, and Stuart has just given a, a fantastic overview of it, we know one thing for certain, that as a playful biography, Orlando was supposed to produce an impossible archive. That is to say, an archive of the facts of material existence across gender, across the ages, across classes, and even across the Enlightenment human-animal divide. 